Good morning. My name is Emily, and I'm one of the pastors here at Campbell, and I want to say thank you to Tanya for uh, being my right-hand woman this morning as we lead worship. And I would like us now to turn our attention to the scripture reading this morning found in the book of Galatians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And it reads like this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children of God, has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever considered the amount of risks that were taken on that very first Christmas morning? Even before that, the amount of risks that were taken. Remember Mary, the risk she took in her response to God. God sends an angel to her, and the angel says, you will bear a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel. And she says, how can this be, since I am a virgin? And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you'll be found with child. And Mary, though she cannot ever fathom what she has just been told, takes a risk when she says, I am your servant, God. May it be so with me. Joseph, who we talked a little bit about last week in worship, took an incredible risk when he listened to an angel that visited him in a dream. You will be the earthly father of a Messiah, Joseph. Mary, though you've had no marital relations with her yet, is going to be pregnant, and you shall name this child Jesus meaning Emmanuel, God with us. And Joseph, you'll remember from last week, had already made up his mind before he went to sleep that night. I'll dismiss her quietly. And he takes a risk to not dismiss her, but instead to accept her, to put his reputation as a righteous man on the line. Risk taking. The shepherds that Christmas night. Can you imagine the risk that they took in accepting the news that Jesus was born for them? See, shepherds were the bottom people of society in those days. They were on the fringes. They had been judged by everyone to be nobodies. Can you imagine the risk that it took for them to believe that this child was born for them? I can almost hear them this morning as they travel to Bethlehem together. Do you really think they'll let us in to see this child who has been born? Yet, they took the risk. Wise people from the East took a risk when they decided to follow the star wherever it might lead and believe the prophecies that a child, an important child, had been born into the world. And they took a risk by lying to King Herod, taking a different way home and telling him that this child wasn't important after all. But the biggest risk of all in this story is the one that God took in sending us God incarnate, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. God sent us a human being, a baby human being, not a grown-up, not an adult who had it all figured out, though as I live more into adulthood, I'm starting to realize adulthood doesn't mean we have it all figured out, but a vulnerable baby laying in a manger. 
Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph in a time when death and oppression by the Roman government ruled the day. They're traveling that night and have to stop in Bethlehem because they have been called upon to take census of themselves in a population census. Death and oppression and control by the Roman government is what's in charge that day. What a risk God took in sending us Jesus. And we also know that Jesus' young life barely escaped death. Because King Herod, even though he'd been told by the wise people, this baby is a nobody after all, demanded that innocent children be killed so that no one could be greater than King Herod. God took an incredible risk in sending us a human being in Jesus Christ. So the question for us this Christmas season then, we have eight more days of Christmas. It did not all wrap up on December 25th, though the radio stations and ABC families' 25 days of Christmas might have you believing it's over. Indeed, it has just begun, friends. We have eight more days of the Christmas season. To figure out our answer to this question, how do we respond to the incredible risk that God took in sending us Jesus Christ. Way back in November, I wonder if this was the sign in your head as you started preparing for Christmas celebrations. Now, maybe not. Maybe that's not exactly where you were, but think with me for a minute about all of the risks that you took to lead up to Christmas Eve and day. You planned a perfect menu with wonderful new recipes. You pieced that meal together and you took a risk that everyone else at the table would think that it tasted just as good as you did. You took a risk to go to the shopping mall and buy the perfect presents and wrap those presents up and place them under the Christmas tree, taking the risk that the grandchild would not open said present and look you in the eye and say, my other grandma got me this gift too. (laughs) You took risks. What if the weather messes up your travel plans, but you bought the plane ticket, you filled the car up with gas, you made the arrival time Anyway, you took the risk that maybe in a month when the credit card bill comes, you'll simply sit and wonder why in the world (laughs) risks. One of my favorite Christmas movies, it is my favorite Christmas movie, I watch it at least once a year if not 20, is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. It's about a man named Clark W. Griswold who takes risk after risk to have a fun, old-fashioned family Christmas. That's his goal the entire movie. And if you know the movie and have every line memorized like I may or may not, you know that scene after scene unfolds to show us, the audience, that the risks that he takes give little reward. First, there's the risk that he and his family take in not going to a tree farm to cut down a tree, but instead going into the forest, open forest, he says, to cut down the most important Christmas symbol, a tree. He takes the risk of cutting it down with his own saw, bringing it home to his house, and reaps the reward of broken windows when the thing is too big to fit in his living room. He takes the risk of letting others cook the meal with his wife, and everybody offers their cooking skills, only one of the characters there isn't very skilled at cooking, so the risk of her cooking the turkey ends up with the reward of a meal that is not edible. And you know, later in the movie, we see the biggest risk in that tree, reap the reward, this scene right here, where a live squirrel comes out of said tree and wreaks havoc on the entire house. Christmas vacation 
is the holiday experience that sums up what we all know, but what we want to forget every single year. Celebration is messy. Celebration is not perfect. Gathering all of the family together, all of your friends together, is hard sometimes. Expectations that the risks of the right presents, the perfect menus, will give us the reward of the feeling that we finally got it perfect are dangerous expectations. They'll disappoint us every time. And if perfect menus and perfect presents and even making perfect memories Having a Norman Rockwell painting kind of Christmas is the way you are responding to the risk that God took in sending us Jesus Christ. Your response is simply limited. What if instead our response was to be vulnerable enough to accept our adoption into God's family. The Apostle Paul writes for us this morning about the grace of God, which adopts us into God's family, making us children, heirs of God, the Apostle Paul writes. Grace illuminates our lives by calling us to be members of God's family and calling us to take the risks that matter to God. Christmas is simply not all about the expectations and the pressures that we put on the risks that we take to make the day the most perfect day of the year. Instead, Christmas is about us being given grace through the risk of God sending Jesus, a vulnerable baby to vulnerable human beings. Our response to that risk needs to be vulnerability of our own. Our response to that risk is to take our place in God's family. One of my favorite short stories is by an author named Raymond Carver, and he tells a story about this family, this mom and dad and this little boy who's turning eight. And so they begin the preparations for this uh, boy's birthday party, and everything is going wonderful. The decorations are bought. Everything's ready to go, except the mom hasn't done one thing. She's forgotten to get to the bakery to order the cake. So she goes to the bakery to order the cake, and she's flipping through the book, and she finally sees the one that will be perfect. She tells the baker, My boy, we went to the zoo last summer, and he loves zoo animals, so this one with zebras and giraffes and monkeys, this is the perfect cake. And so she orders the cake and goes home and tells her husband excitedly about the cake, and they put their their baby boy to bed, and they tell him, tomorrow when you wake up, it'll be your eighth birthday. And then when you get home from school, grandma and grandpa and all our family will be here to celebrate with you. And so the next day, they wake up, and... The mom is putting the finishing touches on the decorations and they're wrapping presents and they wake their birthday boy up and send him off to school. They live only about a block away from school, so it's really easy for him to walk himself to school. And so they send him away, expecting that later that night they'll be celebrating with him his birthday. But about 10 minutes after they send him to school, they receive the worst phone call a parent can ever receive. Their birthday boy stepped off of the curb on his walk, and at the same time, a car swerved. He's in the hospital now. So they rush there, and they find bad news after bad news, and they start to do exactly what you and I do in those situations. You just survive, right? You do whatever it takes to just survive. And so day after day, they take turns going home to feed the cat and get the mail and make each other dinner and bring leftovers to the hospital. And and days just turn into weeks. And each time one of them is home, they, they receive a phone call. And when they pick up the phone, on the other end of the line, there's a voice that's quiet but angry, saying, 
you forgot. You forgot. Over and over again, you forgot. And so they decide not to tell each other about the phone call. They decide to deal with it one uh, by themselves. But eventually the stress of the phone calls and the stress of the entire situation gets to them and they share with each other one night at the hospital this phone call. It's a pranker. We got to take care of it. It's driving us nuts. And so they decide that when they go home that night, they'll figure out what this prank call business is about. But they receive the worst news that night. There's nothing more the doctors could do. And they come home that evening without their birthday boy. And the phone rings. And the mom picks up the phone, and something in the background of the phone call this time makes her realize who the caller is. And so even though it's 4 o'clock in the morning, she tells her husband, we're getting in the car and we're going to go take care of this right now. And so they drive to the strip mall and they bang on the door and they're not getting the attention of anyone, so the husband starts to bang with her and they start to scream and eventually someone opens the door, welcomes them into his shop and says, what, what do you need? And, and the mom says, quit calling us about the cake. We can't have a birthday party anymore. Our son is dead. And the baker looks in her eyes and says, you know what? My wife is dead too. About six months ago, she died and she was the one who would always call people when they forgot their cakes. And I forgot how hard it is at first. Those first few hours, those first few days, I forgot how heartbreaking it is. And I started to isolate myself and I started to get angry and mad and I started to take it out on other people. And I forgot what it's like to be vulnerable to others. And so he, he takes three chairs and puts them around a table and he takes fresh baked bread that he will use later in the bakery that day and hot coffee and he pours them and makes them what I believe is a communion meal. What I believe is a time where they start to share together what it looks like now to be adopted into a new family. To be vulnerable to one another. To tell one another that life is hard sometimes. To tell the truth. To say that life isn't fair. To be honest with one another to say that this is hard, to be open, to take risks that matter to God. Parker Palmer is a Quaker preacher and educator, and he says this about the birth of Christ. What an infant needs is not theological debate, but nurturing the same is true of all the good words seated in yours and I's souls that cry out to become embodied in this broken world. If these vulnerable but powerful parts of you and I are to find courage to take on flesh, to suffer yet survive and thrive, to transform our lives along with the life of the world, then they need the shelter of unconditional love. This morning, you're invited to take the risk to be vulnerable to God and one another, to accept that you have been adopted. Let us pray. Oh God, this morning we are thankful for our adoption into your family, our adoption by your grace and grace alone. God, you sent an incredible light in the darkness. And we need to know this morning, deep in our souls, that the light will overcome darkness. That grace, O oh God, will ever overcome our failures. That, oh God, your love is enough. 
Help us, O oh God, to have the courage and faith again to claim our place in your family and to accept the grace that you have poured out in our lives over and over again. Oh God, we love you and we lift this prayer to you. In the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, amen.